Hello, everybody, and welcome to another one of our sessions of In Conversations with Lawyers. Uh, I'm delighted this afternoon to have Sarah Corbett with us, uh, who's going to offer insights onto quite a range of careers, and I'm going to get Sarah to cover what they might be in a minute. But before we do that, thanks very much for offering to do this, Sarah. It's much appreciated. No problem at all. Do you want to give the listeners a quick thumbnail sketch of your varied and continuing career activities? Sure. So um, I did social and political sciences at King's Cambridge. Um, then following that, I did a law conversion course and then the LPC. I qualified as a solicitor specialising in criminal defence and um, after doing that for, for several years, I then went into legal education here at the University of Law, which is um, previously known as the College of Law, starting off teaching very much on the criminal team on the bar course, but then branching out into other subjects like law conversion, um, LLB and so on. Then I went into management here. While I was doing that, I've studied for a master's and I'm currently near completion of a PhD and I've also qualified as a barrister while I've been here so I think that's it in a in a nutshell. Yeah you've, you've done almost everything in the mix there <laughs> I think and one reason I did want us to have this conversation is it, uh, to touch on the PhD uh, in due course because that's something that the listeners will find uh, they haven't heard anything much about today but why don't we start with your insights into life as a as a solicitor in criminal defense where you started and I think what was very interesting when we chatted pre earlier about this you were very keen to emphasize that it's a way of life rather than just a job so I think if you want to start around those insights that would be great yeah sure so I think it very much depends on the area of um, law you go into I was was very focused on doing um, criminal defense and that's sort of why I wanted to to be a lawyer so just to make people aware of what it entails so really from the way you know from when you start as a trainee you're given quite a lot of responsibility often managing your own casework and you'll be going out to police stations and generally on call overnight and weekends so you know you might have to cancel social events sometimes because somebody gets arrested and you have to go to the police station to represent them but I always found that quite exciting, getting taxis, you know, in the middle of the night through London, seeing um, areas of life that you might not otherwise see, you know, sort of um, for those of you who like watching crime dramas on TV, particularly if any of you have seen 24 hours in police custody. Obviously, if you're the lawyer going in, you get your privy to the confidential conversations with your client, the, the sort of thing that wouldn't be broadcast on TV. So you really get to the heart of things as a trainee you wouldn't be doing advocacy in the magistrates and, and courts and the youth court that would only come after qualification um, but again you know you're traveling around a lot it's not an office-based job so it's very much a lifestyle similarly if you go down the barrister route rather than the solicitor route you'll often be although you know court tends to be within office hours um, you'll often be preparing evenings and weekends. You might get a brief at very short notice the night before a hearing. So, again, you've got to make your life um, fit around that. Mm. And resiliency is obviously a topic uh, that accompanies that sort of way of life. Any insights, any observations about just how practical that has to be, uh, particularly from your own experience? Yes. So, you, I mean, there will be periods where you will be a bit sleep deprived. For example, you know, I remember once I was duty solicitor um, at a particular police station and the cases kept coming in. I got there at six at night and I left at six in the morning, went home, had two hours sleep, got up, went to court um, and did cases there. So, you know, I mean, that's not a typical day, but there will be times when that happens or times when if one of your clients gets arrested for something really serious and you might spend, you know, a period of, I, I remember one of, once one of mine got arrested for attempted murder and I spent um, a period of 48 hours pretty much in one police station. I did have a bit of a break when I went home to sleep and then came back. But, um, you know, those cases are interesting and quite exciting. Um, 
but you know you'll be very much immersed in in what you're doing mm. um another thing you know eating and sleeping have to sort of fit a little bit around those sort of things but the sort of thing that is quite necessary to do as a distraction and downtime you don't have to be particularly personal but what sort of things really are helpful in your experience I think I mean I think it's very imp- important to have a social life to have things that you um enjoy doing you know whether it's going to the gym whether it's going to the pub with your friends like I said sometimes you might have to rearrange those activities but I think it, it's really important that you still keep up with those and obviously when you're going traveling all the time between courts and police stations it's good to be physically fit um make sure you eat properly and take care of yourself generally and that includes having other things going on great and the rewards the upside the rewards are not massively financial, if I'm being honest. Um, I don't think that will come as a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can make a lot of overtime sometimes by doing police stations, although it's not as lucrative as it used to be because of cuts in legal aid. Um, but the results are, can be incredibly rewarding. As, as I said, part of it is it's interesting. No two days are the same. You're not stuck in an office behind a computer all the time. Um, but also from a personal level, the satisfaction that you get, um, you know, for example, when you get a client bail or you stop them getting a prison sentence, those rewards, you know, you can't really put a price on that. Okay. And just before we move on, for for students who are interested in going down this route, obviously face validity will count for a lot through the application process. What can what can students be doing to build a profile? Um, and you can touch on some of the things that happens at the University of Law if you like, because I know law schools all have are aware of this and they all do various yeah. things to help. But within the University of Law and outside it, how should students be building that profile? Mm. So I would say engage with your careers or employability services as uh, as soon as you can. We've got a good one here and we've got people who are obviously aware of different branches of the legal profession. Um, focus your applications. I think it's a bit easier if you want to work in the city because they do more events. They've got glossy brochures. If you want to do legal aid, you have to do a bit more of the running yourself. Um, I remember when I was doing it just going through the phone book at time. This is in the days where there was a phone book during my age, phoning up firms and finding out whether you got training contracts. But the one I got, actually, I got through here because I did the LPC um, at was what was then the College of Laws, now the University of Law. Um, and it was one of the ones they had in their sort of list of ones to apply for if you wanted to do criminal defence. So, um, you know, they will know... Um, from previous years, students who've gone to different firms. So I would say empl- engage with your careers or employability service is really important. Um, there's no obviously no substitute for getting good grades. Some people sometimes make the mistake of thinking legal aid firms, you know, are, are somehow lesser intellectually, and that's not true. Actually, criminal law and evidence is is really quite complex. So there's, there's, you know, you you need to to show that you can get the grades, but it's a bit more than that because you also need to show that you can engage with people, you can deal with people in very difficult circumstances. If you do criminal work, you'll be dealing with a lot of youths, you'll be dealing with a lot of people who are very vulnerable, particularly people with mental health problems. So I think any work experience that shows that you can deal with people in difficult situations and just in real life situations, is useful and then anything that shows public speaking and advocacy experience because crime is a very advocacy based area of law Um, so you know mooting competitions things like that any advocacy competitions are really useful as well do you just touching on a couple of volunteering things do you come across students who volunteer to be responsible adults or uh, absolutely court support units any of those sorts of things definitely so appropriate adults in the police station I think is really good experience I've had students before who volunteered with I think it's called Ipsy it's a charity that deals with um, young people who are excluded from education representing them at appeals that kind of thing A general advice work, Citizens Advice Bureau, even if it's not specifically crime related, it still shows that you can explain the law in a clear way that you, again, deal with vulnerable people. 
that was really helpful. Let's move on to the bar now. Uh, and you did cross qualify. Um, insights again along the lines you've just been giving us for that side of the profession, but perhaps start by saying why you did want to uh, cross qualify at some point. What was your rationale? Yes, yeah, so it was initially because I was teaching on the bar course, and and I thought you know that would that had helped my teaching to be able to see that side of the profession. There's not that much different in terms of what you do. So if you're a solicitor with higher rights, which is what I was, you can effectively do anything anything that a barrister does. Um, if you're a barrister and you get the direct access, you can do anything that a solicitor does. And you know, obviously you can get police station accreditation too. So in terms of criminal law, the profession I think is, is less divided in terms of what you do. Obviously the working arrangements are slightly different in that barristers tend to be self-employed through chambers, whereas solicitors tend to be employed in firms. Um, and I think for me, being a barrister fits because I've got a full-time job here and I can take particular days when I can be free to, to, to go into court. I think it's a, it's a bit more difficult to be a duty solicitor when you've got another job because there's you know you have to commit to a certain um, amount of hours and and so on um but you know it, it gives you the freedom to do it and i always enjoyed very much the advocacy so obviously the bar is is focused on that side of it mm. and how do you and this is a, a perennial question for anybody looking at the bar how do you check that chambers is a good fit for you because although at one point students will think that all chambers are the same particularly going through the sort mm -hmm. of pupillage application type of process I think you probably are aware just how different they are and how important that is when you go start to go through that process how do you how can you check on that absolutely so I mean for me it was really important that I went to a chambers that had a real sort of social justice ethos, a chambers that were, you know, aligned with my views politically and that did defence work because I don't prosecute, I'm a defence lawyer. Um, and there aren't that many chambers who are defence only. It's much easier these days. You don't have to do so much legwork, you know, searching through, you know, back in the day, it was a big hard copy of Chambers of Partners. These days, all mm. that's online, all chambers have their website. You can see... Um, the profiles of the people who work there, you know, you can see their sort of background, whether it aligns with your qualifications and experience um, and so on. So, yes, just do your research online, really, I think is key. And face validity for a set of chambers. It, obviously, there'll be some similarities with um, with a, a law firm, but I guess there might be other things that they're looking for in order to make that connection with you. Absolutely. I mean, again, things like advocacy experience are key and making sure you align with Chambers ethos, because there will be a lot of people who've got, you know, good two ones and first some good universities have got the mini pupillages and so on. I mean, that's just the basic. If you're applying to a Chambers that does things like civil liberties, obviously having campaign work experience, having done that sort right. of work will make you stand out from the crowd um other chambers you know sh you know if you're going into commercial you want to show business acumen and and so on so make sure that you your your experience aligns with the chambers that you're applying to so you don't waste applications mm. and i know i think you're quite a strong believer in the ability to tell a story that's engaging when you come to meet well yeah. any anybody who's a lawyer really because it sounds innocuous, but telling a story is often what you do professionally and you have to do it well. So you have to be able to tell your own story. Do you want to say a little bit about that as well? Absolutely. I mean, when you go into court, really, you're telling, particularly if you're doing something like a plea mitigation, so you're trying to get somebody a lower sentence, you're telling their story as they would if they'd had your privileges and advantages. You know, you're, you're, you're sort of narrating their life, really, and often putting a counter narrative to the sort of dominant court position or prosecution position. Um, so if you can't even tell your own narrative, I, I think Chambers would say, how can we trust you to, to speak for, for other people? So you need to be persuasive about what you've done. Um, and that's key because, as I said, again, often you'll be competing with people who aren't that different to you in terms of CV. It's how you sell yourself, really. 
That's that's great. Before before we move on, <clears throat> something just to put you on the spot a little bit. I'm a great believer in through the free representation unit. Now, I thought I'd just take the opportunity to ask how many how prevalent is it at the at uh, the University of Law stage when students are both doing their sort of professional courses? Do you get quite a a number of them doing through? And if that's the case, could you say a little bit about that for the audience? Absolutely, yes. So, I mean, definitely. And, and for people who don't know, FRU do cases in either employment law or, or social security law. They provide you with training and then you go on to do cases. Um, I know during the pandemic, it was when the tribunals were shutting down, it was more difficult for students to get cases. But I think yeah. that's sort of opening up now. And I think it's I think generally the feeling I get is a more cases available in social security law rather than employment law. I mean, again, this is a great way to help somebody's life. I mean, for somebody who's struggling, particularly in the cost of living crisis, to enable somebody to, you know, to, to win their appeal against benefit sanctions or to get them access to more benefits, you know, I think is one of the most worthwhile things you can do to, to practically help people at the moment. And again, even if you're not focused on that area of law, it's for anything crime family housing immigration all of those sort of immigration uh, sorry all of those advocacy based subjects it really helps definitely um so you know and it's it's, it's also not just the advocacy it's the fact that you're advising a client dealing with um, them, helping them with their issues. So, yeah, things like through and law centres. I mean, again, you know, law centres have suffered with with cuts just as legal aid has. So, again, there's not that many opportunities as there used to be. But something like through is definitely worth doing, I would say. Great. Well, let's move on again, because that was uh, that. Uh, that <clears throat> Excuse me, you had that uh, that uh, conversation nicely rounded off there and really touch on the sort of academic side of your career now, uh, including the PhD. Um, I'm just looking at your profile on my other screen, and I, th I think I'm right in saying that you started with the University of Law while at the end before doing the PhD and whilst you were still a solicitor. But the audience need to know that you're now associate dean and associate professor at the University of Law. So it has been a career trajectory in its own right, a career progression. Do you want to say a little bit about? that for the audience who are thinking perhaps coming later to a PhD or the value of a PhD or an academic legal career, any of those Absolutely. elements to it, really? Yes. So, I mean, if you're coming straight from practice and you haven't got research experience or you haven't got a doctorate, it's not that easy to get a position at, at a public research university. If you're a lawyer, one sort of quite nice route into academia is to go through teaching initially perhaps on the professional courses like the bar course or the LPC and then you can get into law conversion LLB teaching you know and it sort of expands your your teaching portfolio that way so if you you know if you if you have got practice experience as a solicitor or barrister that's a sort of alternative route um, into academia um I mean, the, the PhD, I, I sort of really created a rod for my own back because um, it's something that um, I don't get time release to do. But I, obviously, my university are very supportive of it and they've given me opportunities to speak at conferences here and to use my research and to sort of feed it into course design. So I do feel like it's making an impact here, um, but it's something I do completely in my own time. So. Um, you know, again, those those weekends that I used to spend at the police station and I've, and I've spent writing up the PhD. Um, I think it would have been very hard to do that if I'd done a PhD that was based on sort of empirical research. Um, the benefit of mine is very theoretical, so it's something I can do. Um, and again, you know, the fact that everything's on the Internet has really benefited me. You know, if I'd done this 20 years ago, I'd have probably spent too much time at libraries photocopying things. But now at least, you know, you through libraries, you can access things um, online. But it is very much a labour of love. And I would say to people, if you're going into a PhD part time, you know, obviously this is something you're going to be doing for sort of between five and seven years. So it has to be something that you're really committed to. And it has to be something that you're doing regularly. With a master's, it's kind of easier to keep the motivation up because you have deadlines for, you know, a lot of the teaching will be, you know, you have teaching, so it's not just research. Um, and, 
you know, you, you will have deadlines for particular essays and dissertations. For the PhD, you have to be a lot more self-motivated because a lot of it is just you getting on with it, really, which is great because it gives you the complete freedom of, of what you're doing. Um, but you have to realise it is for the long haul. And, and again, it's something you're going to have to make sacrifices for in your non-work life. Mm. Yes. I mean, I think we should have said that, that it is a part time PhD. It's been six years so far. It's it's I'm in the sixth year. Yes. So it will be six years in October. So that's quite standard. And that will probably be hopefully that'll be the end in October. I'm aiming to submit this year. Yes. Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, it, it'll be sorry to see it go in some ways, though, um, but it'll be nice to have it completed. Well, what will happen subsequently? Is there a career trajectory that will rely to some extent on the PhD? Would you, you know, what are your options that you you can then explore with the PhD? Yes. I mean, I haven't got a sort of a fixed idea of what I want to do with it. Again, I want to keep sort of feeding it into to what I'm doing here. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I would like to look at having it published. That's a little bit down the line but that's what I'd like to do with it but I think it's it will be good to have it and certainly you know none of us 100% know where our careers will be in five years time and hopefully that will just give me more options in the future I mean I'm not immediately looking to leave here because I'm happy here but like I said you know you, you never know how things might pan out in the future was it tricky finding a supervisor that will be this will be my last question on the PhD was it well, actually, that was a story because um, I had a supervisor, but then um, she sort of parted company with with the university she was at. So then I, there was a kind of sort of scramble where I had a PhD place, but suddenly my supervisor had gone. Um, but luckily, because, you know, that university, Birkbeck, um, specialised in those sort of areas of law they were able to find me somebody else um but that that was a moment of panic <laughs> yes. probably probably not the last one but we won't take you we won't take you down that that route um just as we come to a a, a close uh, sarah any final insights you you get the tenor of the nature of these conversations what what would you like to leave the audience with as um your final words I think, I mean, just to say that legal practice and academia are so related with each other. A lot of lawyers will um, write articles in journals. A lot of academic lawyers are still very connected with practice. So I would say don't see it as an either or. Um, the two are connected, you know, and your career can be fluid and take you in and out of both at, at different stages. OK, well, that's great. Great final words, Sarah. Um Thanks very much for doing all of that. I'm sure Not it's going to be greatly appreciated. Happy to help. Thank you.